Thank you to everyone who left a comment in the previous video where we covered Zinedine Zidane's Real Madrid. To keep this series going, let me know in the comments down below what historic team we should cover next. The comment with the most upvotes will be the topic of the next video in the series. Today we're going to be looking at how Pep Guardiola completely revolutionised modern football during his time at Barcelona from 2008 to 2012. Pep Guardiola was appointed as Barcelona manager in 2008 following a trophyless season. And what followed that appointment is arguably one of the greatest periods in the club's history, winning a club record 14 trophies, including two Champions Leagues and three consecutive La Liga titles. So how exactly did he do it? Well, let's start by taking a look at his preferred starting 11 and formation throughout his tenure. In his first two seasons in charge, the most common formation was a 4-3-3, with the core of the team of Valdez, Puyol, Pique, Alves, Xavi and Messi remaining consistent. During the 08-09 season, the 4-4-2 diamond formation was also relatively common, a highlight of which was in their 6-2 win against Real Madrid to help them win La Liga. This worked extremely well, because the two forwards of Henri and Eto could move into the space left by Messi playing as a false nine. The following season in 09-10, there were some key additions to the team. Iniesta came in for Cato, Toure gave way for Busquets, and Eto and Henri were replaced by Pedro and Ibrahimovic. The following season in 2010-11 is largely considered as the greatest in his time at Barcelona, as they became one of the most exciting and dynamic teams in world football. The core formation remained a 4-3-3, but given the intricate rotations, the formation would often resemble either a 3-4-3 or even a 3-3-4. The lineup remained relatively unchanged, with Villa moving in on the left wing, leaving Messi as a false nine and Pedro on the right. Finally, his last season in charge saw arguably the biggest shift in his tactics. The arrival of Cesc Fabregas saw Barcelona have an overwhelming number of world-class midfielders and so the formation would occasionally shift into a Cruyffian 3-4-3 diamond formation, with Busquets dropping deep, Messi as a false nine and Fabregas as the creative playmaker in the final third. While there were a few important changes in personnel, the core of the squad remained unchanged, which is an important point for any team that wishes to maintain a level of consistency and chemistry between the players. So how exactly did they become so dominant? Well, to understand that, let's take a look at what Pep Guardiola's footballing philosophy is all about. No matter the season and change in tactics, Pep's philosophy has remained consistent throughout his career and can be summed up by the so-called positional play. Starting lineups can give us a small window of insight into how his teams would play, but that all goes up in the wind once the game has started. Players in his teams must be able to think on their feet, with each action having a specific reaction. This would translate to the so-called tiki-taka style of play, a word that Guardiola supposedly hates as it discredits all the underlying advantages of quick intricate passing and creating a numerical advantage to disrupt the opposition. To get the players to think this way, Pep would divide the pitch into these specific zones, with a simple rule of no more than three in each horizontal zone and two in each vertical zone. I recently made a video covering these specific type of pitch zones, so if you want to know the main advantages of this system, check out this video for a more detailed description. But now let's take a look at what this translated to on the pitch at Barcelona. On the pitch, this style of play always started from the back line, with Valdez looking to play the ball into the centre backs. Guardiola is famously against the use of direct long balls, as this would isolate the team's centre forward against the opposition's defence, and so his style would always look to build from the back to create opportunities in a more organised manner. If under pressure, Pique and Puyol would split wide to gain better passing angles. By doing this, this would free up central channels for either Toure or Busquets to drop deep to form a back three, allowing the fullbacks to immediately gain ground past the opposition's first line of press. If the holding mid was left unmarked, then he could immediately turn and start the next phase of progress. However, if he was under pressure, then it meant the opposition had one less player in midfield, and so space would open up for either one of the other two midfielders to come and collect the ball, or even for Dani Alves to cut inside and pick up the ball in a more central position. On occasion, Messi could also drop into this inside channel, freeing up the wing for the extremely aggressive Dani Alves to attack on the flank. With Messi moving inside, it would create a numerical advantage in the centre, where the team could now rotate possession and look for gaps to move it out wide to Thierry Henry or a through ball for Samuel Eto'o. The whole principle around this style of build-up was to always create a man-advantage situation, forcing the defending team to overcompensate in certain areas, 
and thus freeing up space on the opposite flanks for a 1v1 situation. While Messi started on the right flank, it was evident that he was so much more dangerous in a central position, and would allow the team to rotate more freely. In his first season, Messi would move inside and link up play with Xavi and Keita, with Dani Alves overlapping on the right flank and allowing Eto and Henri to move more centrally, and onto the opposition's back line. The following season saw a slight shift in how the team played, as the introduction of Ibrahimovic meant the team now had a dedicated centre forward in their team. With Messi slowly becoming more accustomed to this central role, it would often mean Ibrahimovic and Messi would find themselves occupying the same position. Ibrahimovic was less keen on attacking the back line compared to Eto, and would often look to receive the ball to feet. This naturally led to the pair being less effective when playing together, and so a sacrifice had to be made, with Ibrahimovic making way for the return of Henri on the left, Messi as a false nine, and Pedro on the right wing. So while the starting lineup was still a 4-3-3, the formation would often resemble a 4-3-1-2 in the 0-9-10 season, with Messi at the tip, Busquets at the base, and Henri and Pedro further up. These first two seasons set the stage for what Barcelona had to offer, but it was in Guardiola's third season of 2010-11 that the team reached its peak in terms of perfecting the positional play model. What made this team so deadly was the specific roles that were carried out by each of the players. Valdez would play as a sweeper keeper, allowing the defence to keep a high line. The centre backs were used during build up, with the full backs often providing offensive support. But it's in the midfield that the team really started to click on another level, with Busquets, Xavi, and Iniesta each occupying specific roles within the team. Busquets would be used as the pivot, used mostly during build up and providing support to any attack. Xavi was the controller, setting the tempo and recycling possession into less crowded areas, while Iniesta would be the creator, carrying the ball forward, beating his man and providing excellent support to the strikers. It's worth noting the diagonal positioning between the three players, which opens up different passing angles and makes it harder for the opposition to properly mark them without disorganising their lines. In attack, it was a similar story of each player playing to their core strengths to improve the team's performance. Pedro would play as a traditional winger and give width to the team's attack, Villa often playing as a second striker, drifting inside onto his preferred right foot, and finally Messi had the most freedom within the team, dropping deep, taking on opponents or moving out wide on the flanks. He had the license to roam into whichever position he thought was best. With Messi dropping into the midfield, you get the diamond that dominated European teams. The objective was to overload the centre and by dropping deep it caused big issues for the defence. For example, if the centre back followed Messi into the centre, then there would be space for Pedro to cut inside. If they sat back, then Messi could turn and run at the back line, both of which could cause big problems for the opposition. The midfield rotations and individual brilliance of that side led them to a second Champions League victory in three years, and marked the beginning of the end of their European dominance. The following season, while still relatively successful with four trophies, including the Club World Cup and the UEFA Super Cup, the team struggled to reach the bar they'd set themselves, given mostly to injuries to key players and little squad rotation possibilities. Barca would line up in what was only a back four by name. Dani Alves would play high on the right wing, with Abidal occupying a more traditional fullback position and forming a back three. Pep's first instinct was to flood the pitch with midfielders. Fabregas and Iniesta would fill in on the left flank, with the former often playing further up on the pitch as a double false nine with Messi, who took turns dropping deep into midfield, making runs behind the opposition. However, when in a more traditional lineup, Pedro and Alexis Sanchez would start on the wings. While this season stretched the limits of what was possible with Pep's positional play, the constant injuries to key players meant they fell short of La Liga and Champions League success. The main positive from Guardiola's final season in charge of Barcelona was an unbelievable individual effort from Lionel Messi, scoring a total 73 goals in all competitions. Finally, no analysis of this Barcelona side would be complete without taking a look at their incredible defensive mentality. One of the first things that Barcelona did so well that often gets overlooked is how they defended with the ball. While this may seem illogical, whenever they would find themselves in the lead with a very tight margin, they would pass the ball along all 11 of their players to see the game to the end. It's a plan that requires excellent technical skills and the ability to cope with intense pressure from the opposition. Their triangular positioning meant they always kept passing options open and would simply tire out the opponent. Now, in their more conventional way of defending, Guardiola would look to use a high-press, gegenpressing system, closing down the opposition quickly 
especially as soon as they regain possession. To do this, Guardiola invented the 6 second rule, where the players are instructed to put intense pressure for 6 seconds after losing the ball, before falling back if unsuccessful. To increase their chances of regaining the ball high up the pitch, Barcelona would use a number of different pressing traps to trick the opponents. Their pressing shape was mostly directed at covering certain passing lanes, but would leave some open to make the opponent think they had a way out, before closing down the player in possession and forcing a mistake. For example, the team would cover central passing options and force the team into the fullback. From here, they would cover options back to the centre back and to the winger on the flank, leaving a gap to the central midfielder. However, as soon as the pass was made, the midfielders would close this position. Alternatively, they would block off all passing lanes and force a long ball, where the high line and sweeper keeper in Valdez ensured there was little space for the opposition to attack behind the back line. One final aspect to note of their defensive shape was also the use of cover shadows, ensuring a player could both put pressure and limit forward options simultaneously. An example from goal kicks would look like this. Messi between the two centre-backs, Villa and Pedro on the full-backs, Xavi and Iniesta in the half spaces and Busquets covering the space in front of the back line. In this shape, Messi would cover the holding mid and Xavi and Iniesta covered the two holding midfielders while also being ready to double up on one of the centre-backs. The amount of control Guardiola insisted his team had both in and out of possession ensured Barcelona were able to reach a level that few teams in history have ever been able to match. Guardiola left Barcelona in the summer of 2012, before joining Bayern Munich the following year. However, the Champions League trophy has eluded him since 2011, so can he do it without Lionel Messi? And now, let me know what you think. What do you make of this Barcelona side? And do you think we'll ever see a team play with this much elegance once again? Let me know in the comments down below, along with any suggestions for the next episode of this series. As always, if you enjoyed this content, then please leave a like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.